our enrollment system and the impact that that might have on OUSD. Um, in some cities like Denver, enrollment has grown in both charter and um, public schools. In New Orleans and Detroit, uh, there's been a lot of disruption because schools, there's not enough oversight. Schools have been opening and closing and opening and closing. And there are school deserts now in some parts of those cities um, because charter schools still get to choose where they want to locate. Um, so families may not have a school that is anywhere near them, but they, and even if they do, it may not be a school they have access to. Um, so in Newark, um, there has been a pretty significant loss of enrollment from public to charter schools, 9%, more than 9%. Numerous schools have been closed as a result. Um, so there's been mixed results, as you can see. Um, OUSD staff have stated common enrollment will help us to achieve the goal of equity and hope. So tonight we're going to talk about the concept of equity, um, and in particular, Dr. Vasquez Heilig is going to um, say a lot about, you know, what does that look like. Um, but the idea that we've been hearing from our staff in OUSD is that families will have easier access to the better options, some of the better options OUSD has to offer, <coughs> and we as a district will be better positioned to put a stop to some of the exclusionary practices that a lot of people agree are problematic mid-year push out of students, um, not serving children with special needs at the same rate as the district. Um, how all of this would happen has not been spelled out yet. And the plan right now is for those details to come to the board in the fall as part of an equity pledge. Um, that's what it's being called, raft of different kinds of agreements, MOUs on about nine different or eight different subject areas. Um, and enrollment is one of those different areas. Um, and so I just want to say that I don't believe we can have a serious discussion about equity and creating a more equitable system of school assignment without talking about housing and opening. Um, and the fact that this system, a common enrollment system, is not going to change the fact that where a student lives is still the primary factor in determining um, which OUSD school they attend. So, or that attendance at a school in another part of Oakland depends on the ability of a family to be able to transport students reliably to another part of Oakland. Um, we don't have the ability as a district to change the economic status of our families, but we do have the ability and I believe the obligation to have an honest conversation um, about what the, the policy, this policy can reasonably expect, be expected to do to move the dial on access to quality schools. Uh, and the answer is not much. At least if you look at the research from Denver um, and other cities, there's a study that came out last year, the Center for Reinventing Public Education, and it looks at the impact of common enrollment on Denver and in New Orleans. Um, it didn't change segregation, patterns of segregation in schools, or who used the option system. Um, so the same families who are motivated to investigate their options before continue to investigate their options and put, you know, put in an application. Um, it certainly did not create more high quality schools. And to my mind, that is the real problem that we face in Oakland, is that we don't have enough high quality options for the large number of students that we have. Um, there was a recent blog post by Don McClay, as some of you who are on the Yahoo Parents group probably saw it um, last week. He said that what we're being offered is more school choice, but what we need is more school, what we need is school improvement. Um, and that's, that's what's not gonna be uh, changed by a common enrollment system. So, that's where I personally stand. I believe the focus should be on improving our schools. In the meantime, I don't want to see us undertake any strategies that might undermine the viability of our system. Um, and I'm really worried that this could lead to school closures um, and ultimately not solve our problem, which is we need to improve our schools. Um, so for serious about equity, there's some things I think we need that need to be considered um, that will help us address the, our real problem, which is you know uh, what are the limits to access to great schools. So we need to improve our schools, not gonna be helped by common enrollment. Um, OUSD school assignment priorities that privilege neighborhood over other factors. That's a problem, we need to talk about that. The mm -hmm. fact that OUSD doesn't offer transportation except to special education students. And the fact that we can't change who chooses to use the option system. Um, and that's often dictated by socioeconomic status. So until we address the factors that affect where our families live, Poverty, education level, our best strategy, in my opinion, is to try to improve our schools, and this policy, a common enrollment policy, is not going to do anything to support that effort. So I'm going to hand it off to my uh, fellow <coughs> panelists, and Dr. <coughs> Janelle Scott's going to talk a little bit about where does the common enrollment idea come from, and what are some of the other policies that it's related to? And what I am going to do in 10 minutes, hopefully, is talk a bit about taking a, a, a 
several large steps backward and talk a bit about uh, common enrollment and the context in which it emerges. Um, and so I'm going to spend some time talking about ideological shifts uh, around public education and constructions of equity, um, but also talk about the ways in which common enrollment or one app, whatever we want to call it, um, is connected to broader uh, educational policies that we're seeing in districts like Oakland, urban school districts, um, and largely framed around this promise of greater equity um, as a result of their imp implementation. Um, so, as I said, I, I think it's, it's, it's tempting to really focus on common enrollment as a singular issue, but I think I would like to convince you that that's misguided. Um, and I think it's really important to think about what common enrollment is being um, promoted along with, right? And so these plans that we see uh, being implemented or developed in places like New Orleans or Denver or Newark um, are part of this larger effort to really remake school districts um, that we don't want many advocates no longer, they think that school districts are somewhat antiquated and what we really want are districts to remake themselves as managers of a portfolio of schools, right? Um, so charters are part of that portfolio, traditional public schools are part of that portfolio, virtual schools are part of that portfolio, um, alternative and small schools. So it's a real different way of thinking about a school district, no longer unified, and in fact, we're hearing whispers of wanting to rename the Oakland Unified School District uh, to reflect that, right? Um, this is also part of a broader uh, effort to remake public education along market principles, right? And so we see common enrollment really coming as part and parcel of things like school choice, as Shanti mentioned. So that includes things like charter schools and vouchers. Um, but it also includes things like the use of incentives to drive uh, school improvement or teacher behavior, right? The idea that if we provide merit pay for teachers who can demonstrate growth in student learning on standardized assessments through value-added metrics that are very controversial, um, then they should themselves be paid more than teachers who cannot demonstrate that growth. And we're seeing teachers across the country um, be rewarded and sanctioned on, on the basis of these metrics. Um, we're also seeing what's being called personalized learning promoted, right, which is the adoption of technology um, in the service of uh, nominally personalizing learning for students, but in many ways really reshaping and rethinking uh, the way we deliver instruction to students uh, through different apps and <coughs> online systems. We're also seeing the promotion and development of new talent pipelines, right? And we're calling people talent these days, um, right? So um, um, the adoption of performance-based funding so that schools who can demonstrate greater performance and universities, incidentally, and I think it's important to note that um, universities like Berkeley, like other places, are very much a part of, um, in some ways promoting these policies, but also in many ways experiencing the same policies that we're seeing in K-12 schooling. Um, we're also seeing the promotion of mayoral control of schools um, and a push to eradicate elected school boards um, in favor of more professional corporate boards, right? Um, we're also incidentally related to um, efforts to eradicate elected school boards, seeing incredible money being poured into school board elections. It's really unprecedented in American public education history, the amount of money we're, we're seeing from out-of-state donors especially, um, really trying to move the lever on who sits on the boards in, in, in urban school districts, largely because we've, we're seeing that these funders want to have people seated who support these policies, right? Um, and so it's very important to pay attention to, uh, to school board fin uh, election finance these days. So in order to just give a landscape to Alice's question, and I, did, I forgot to acknowledge um, so I, I, some of you look really familiar to me, and I, I forgot to say that I taught in the district for four years in the 90s, um, and uh, before going back to graduate school, and, um, and I'm a parent in the district now, and so it's sort of, you know, my life is being bookended right now in a very tricky <laughs> way. So I have, like, in this section, some doctoral students from Berkeley who are fantastic and could give this talk better than I could, and then a couple teachers from my children's school who are amazing, and so um, I just want to acknowledge those folks in the room. So it's Alice, though. that's why I know her name. Uh, um, we have charter schools right now in 42 states. Um, in Oakland, uh, we have 44 charter schools and about 86 traditional uh, OUSD public schools. And this follows a trend that we're seeing largely that charter schools um, have grown uh, largely across the country, uh, but that we see them highly concentrated in urban school districts, right? And in some urban school districts, especially concentrated, right? Um, they tend to not be primarily a suburban phenomenon, although there are suburban charter schools. Um, 
what we also know about charter schools is that you know a number of students are enrolled in online charter schools, so they don't they never go to a, what is called a bricks and mortar school at all, but they enroll um, online, and those are very controversial. And there's just been some wonderful reporting um, in the San Jose Mercury News about some of the issues in, in virtual charter schools. Um, but there are other choice plans being uh, promoted and implemented. So we have currently 17 school voucher plans in the country. We have about 40 uh, tuition tax credit plans. This is where people can claim a tax deduction um, when they spend money on private school uh, tuition. So it's a sort of backdoor school voucher program. Um, we have roughly 2 million children being homeschooled in the country. Um, we've also seen the development of education management organizations, charter school management organizations, um, and as I said, virtual schooling companies, right? And so we're really shifting the way schools are managed and controlled in urban school districts. Uh, I think it's important to think about charter schools specifically, too, as this sort of funny little policy animal, right? Because on the one hand, they are districts. They're standalone school districts. They are authorized to operate autonomously by a school district or a county board, or in some cases when they're denied to the state. Um, and so they have incredible freedom with some regulation from the school district. Um, but they are also tied to the school district because of that regulation. So they're funny creatures. They're s largely autonomous, except their, their life depends on, on the authorization and reauthorization by their school districts. Although it is very rare for charter schools to be closed by their authorizers. Um, the, the closure rate is very, very low. Okay. As I said, and this is where I'm going to put on my professor hat, right? So a lot of these market-oriented reforms have really been promoted on the basis that they provide greater equity. Um, and what I want to have us think about together tonight is how this really signals a dramatic shift in the way we thought about equity for a really long time in our country, right? And really the, the sort of prevailing notion where I want to start our and signpost the conversation the prevailing notions around equity really emerge out of the civil rights movement, the gains that we made in the civil rights movement. And so um, out of that movement, we uh, developed uh, funding and resources for special education, for example. Uh, we placed enormous resources in school desegregation and school, school finance equity. Um, but what that effort, those efforts can largely be thought of as redistribution, but redistributing downward to <laughs> groups and to communities who had not been well served um, in our traditional public schools, right? So there was a real effort to remedy harm that had been done by our schools and schooling systems, right? And so these efforts were, were, were largely located in, in, in legislative, judicial efforts in the, in, at the federal level, but also at the state level um, to redress and to enforce equity. So choice was a part of those efforts, right? But it was choice in the service of making schools more, di more diverse, making funding more equitable. So choice was never left to be uh, just a matter of individual agency or power. It was always yoked with these other um, policy provisions. We see a shift, though, that happens. And, and, and scholars have thought about this shift happening largely um, in the 1970s and then into the 1980s, where you have a backlash against these norms of equity and an attempt by uh, think tanks, largely conservative think tanks, and, ad and the advocacy sector that they're related to, to help it advance a new logic of empowerment um, through individual rights, right? So that really, when we think about education, uh, it really is a family right. And we are holding parents back. And largely, what this advocacy sector tried to do was reframe equity in terms of black and Latino families having the ability to choose, having the same market power as white parents, right? Um, and so the enemy then of equity and liberty, individual liberty, were state mechanisms that told families where their kids could go to school, right? And so that became the sort of um, the, the target for, for advocacy efforts, right? Where we start to hear comparisons of public schools as the Berlin Wall that needs to be dismantled, right? So that a thousand flowers can, can bloom. And you have groups that start to emerge to support that. By the 1990s, new Democrats um, <coughs> come to embrace this frame. And so you have Democrats who normally would be supportive of traditional public schooling really uh, splinter from this, this coalition that had been in place for about 30 or 40 years um, and discover this thing that we call the achievement gap. So rather than talking about opportunity, we talk more about achievement and outcomes, right? Um, and school choice forms offered by this alliance move much more in the direction of markets and away from a broader kind of communitarian notion of equity. 
Um, and so bringing us to the present, what we have is the emergence of education reform and advocacy organizations, some who may be present in the room tonight, I hope so, because I think it's important to be in conversation, um, that we have new civil rights organizations that are single issue organizations solely focused on advancing school choice. So groups like Parent Revolution, um, which supports parent trigger laws, uh, the Black Alliance for Educational Options, which has a uh, national uh, organization, but then also chapters, um, and, the, and the Hispanic uh, HCREO, which is the Latino version of, of BAO. Um, Shanti's giving me the, <laughs> so, so anyway. What I'm saying is we've had an evolution of how we've thought about equity, and now we've come to only think about equity largely through the prism of choice um, and managerialism in schools. Um, I just want to introduce this quote, and I, I do need to type because I, I don't want to dominate the panel, but charter schools were yoked to a progressive version, <laughs> vision of equity initially. There were very uh, progressive, equity, traditionally equity-oriented folks who were involved in early charter school advocacy. But we saw that quite quickly give way to hedge fund investment, right? Where people <laughs> figured out that there are ways to make money in this sector, a lot of money through real estate, through the selling of technology, through the selling of curriculum, through franchising. And so what I have up here is a quote from an industry uh, report that was encouraging in 2002 in investors on Wall Street to invest in charter schools and explaining that it was going to be possible what, what the policies were, how the policies were going to shift. Um, and so I'm going to let, let you all read that. Um, but you can see that in many ways um, we are living what was predicted in 2002 uh, by financial analysts. Um, so what that ends up then is in Oakland, we have our <coughs> leaders talking about common enrollment as an idea that whose time has simply come. And what I think is dangerous about that framing is it leaves out the incredible networks and funding mechanisms um, through philanthropies, through advocacy organizations that are very much a part of generating the ideas whose time has come. And I think, on the one hand, this is largely untested in many places. Uh, Frank is going to talk to us in five seconds about what we know about what's happened in New Orleans. Um, but an idea whose time has come has very little research evidence to support its efficacy. And so um, I, I, I need to stop here, but I hope we can be in conversation about what the implications of that are, that we're willing to go whole hog on an effort, or a set of efforts, that really, when we think about the research evidence base, is highly, highly, highly contested. So what is the 2007 CER report? What is CER? Application reform produced a report talking about Oakland as a national model. This is what, uh, on the heels of the Randy Ward uh, leadership. And it was saying, well, Oakland's sort of on the cusp. It could be this national leader for school choice and uh, the real rethinking management, or it might go the other way. And, and from their perspective, that would be a negative way going backwards in terms of moving away from school choice. Um, this is, you can no longer find this online, by the way. Um, I have the link, I can email it to all of you. <laughs> um, but I, I double checked today, it's, it, I went to the Center for Reform uh, website. You can get the two page uh, description, but you can no longer get this report online. So I, I brought 20 copies, but I'm happy, like I said, to email the link or whatever. So. I'm auctioning these off after that. <laughs> So I am going to piggyback on a lot of what Janelle just said, and um, as you can see, I'm framing common enrollment as part of a bigger picture as well, and that picture <laughs> is um, basically a market theory that um, choice is the best way to allocate public services, and uh, I'm going to uh, disrupt that on a lot of different levels, um, because what we've found is that... Uh, Common enrollment is really a facade. It's not actual choice for families. Um, you'll see up there that we have uh, a report which is focused specifically on New Orleans. On the right, it's downloadable at the SCOPE website. And we just came out with a six country comparison book on the left, which looks at three countries that are privatized and three countries that have done a public investment model, which I will get to in a second. So um, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about what's at stake right now. I'm going to talk about how do we arrive at choice in education. I just spoke about that for a second. And I'm going to connect a lot of different levels in education. Um, I, I think about things comparatively. So I'm going to look internationally, 
all the way down through our school system to what happens to students in the classroom, because that's really what we want to know about. I'm going to talk about the New Orleans situation in particular, because uh, New Orleans is, I don't know, five years, ten years ahead of Oakland right now. So it's a possible outcome, and I want you to think about what could happen. And um, that's number five. What can we learn from Oakland? So, uh, oh, from New Orleans. What does uh, this number mean? Does anybody know what this number is? Not the U.S. This is the world. This is the global education estimated annual value in 2014. That's what's at stake, just putting a number on it. Right? Where does the number come from? Well, Rob Hutter, CEO of Learn Capital VC Fund in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley here, um, presented this figure at the sixth International Private Education Conference hosted by the World Bank, and actually not even the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private arm of the World Bank. So what I really need to do is you need to see what the levels are. That is what's at stake. There is a lot of money, Janelle talked about the various ways in which you can get your hands on some of that money, but if you're thinking about 10% of profits per year guarantee, that's like $500 billion. So, then let's think about what happened. Um, as Janelle was talking about the, the rationales, um, she talked in the 70s about um, the equity moves in the United States. Well, there was a very different move that happened in Chile in, the, United, in uh, the 70s, and that was a Pinochet privatization move, in particular the implementation of vouchers. And it was a neoliberal move founded on the philosophies and economics of Milton Friedman. Finland did something very different. In the 1970s, they reshaped their education system and it focused on equity. And then in, two th in the 2000s, we have 100,000 people on the streets in Chile. That's a social movement after 30 years of privatization. Um, and the outcome has been a radical segregation of Chilean society at the student level. <coughs> Finland, on the other hand, in 2000, came out and um, scored at the top levels consistently on the international assessments and is now the kind of worldwide darling for how to run an education system. So we see that this is actually uh, a historical conversation. This is, this is a done deal in different places. So I want to reflect that, that we're having, uh, we're, we're talking about issues like they're current, but they also have a strong root in, in a couple of generations now. So in the book, we look at a bunch of different countries. Uh, and today, I want to focus in particular on Canada and the United States. And I want to drill down. Um, into what happened in New Orleans in particular. And to start at the country level, actually, New Orleans couldn't have really happened without Bush's NCLB. No Child Left Behind law sets up an accountability model that if schools are not making adequate yearly pro pro uh, progress, then they can be reconstituted. So in 2003, and this is before Katrina, Louisiana Institutes, the recovery school district, which is, serves as the takeover mechanism, for the entire state. And so we're talking about renaming districts like Janelle just spoke about, renaming OUSD. There's this idea of reframing the governance around school districts. 2005, Hurricane Katrina happened. Louisiana passed Act 35, an emergency session. Um, the Act 35 basically uh, changed the cut point for failure, um, making most schools in New Orleans uh, susceptible to takeover. Uh, uh, they were also fired 7, 000, over 7,000 teachers without due process. That went to court and is still in court actually, 10 years later. Um, and there was just an overall shift to charter schools. And I want to differentiate something about charter schools because Janelle mentioned that, you know, in the beginning, Al Shanker saw charter schools as this individual place for us to learn about new pedagogical methods supported by literally a union head. Well, now that political animal has been changed into uh, a money-making machine. So corporate charter chains are operating without public accountability. They have privately appointed boards. Um, they have a, a, you know, and when you get into what actually constitutes a, a, a governance mechanism in New Orleans, you have charter schools operating independently as local 
education administration. You have CMOs operating as a nested group. Everything's operating in the recovery school district. Why am I telling you this? Because there's really no accountability for the public. The public doesn't get to say, this is how our community school is going to be run. So what happens in this education marketplace? How does it function? The recovery school district is basically an authorizer. It's not an, an education delivery um, governance model. It uh, oversees the accountability system, and it's implemented common enrollment. So basically, um, after Katrina, it was uh, what I call, and if you if you got one of these booklets, it explains the kind of pathway to privatization in New Orleans. And um, there was this period I call it um, the deregulated period in New Orleans, but it's really uh, it was kind of just a free for all because basically principals at schools were operating without any public accountability at the district or state level. What does that mean? They're deciding who enrolls. They're deciding which kids to suspend or expel, which discipline policies to have. They're basically like horse trading kids across schools. Um, so to mitigate that, they installed a common enrollment um, program, which I'll talk about in a second. So what are schools doing? Schools, the mechanism in um, New Orleans is that charter schools compete for students, right? And the incentive is basically test scores. And they, so what does that mean? If your school is being opened or closed and those decisions are being made on test scores, you need to have higher test scores. So what's a good way to have higher test scores? Well, teach kids. Another good way to have higher test scores? Get lower test score kids out of your school, right? So that push out, we discuss the way that exclusion happens in these reports. And one way that it happens is through these zero tolerance discipline policies where a kid messes up, they get three demerits, they get three suspensions, they get an expulsion, and they're gone, right? And it just, it can happen before, well, let's be clear. It happens after they get the money for this child being in the seat on October 2nd and before test day, whenever that comes, right? So. Um, yeah, so, these data are being. We're going to do questions. Yeah, we're doing Q and A afterwards. <laughs> um, okay, so what does that mean in general? And I want you to. I want this as a major point when you take away. School choice in New Orleans doesn't mean that families choose schools. It means that more often than not, schools choose students, right? And how do they choose these students? They choose them by test scores. So Shanti uh, said that some charter schools have admissions policies. In New Orleans, <laughs> the highest performing schools have their tests two, two months before the one app opens, the common enrollment program opens. So if you're not in the know and you don't take the test, you're not getting into that school. Not to mention the fact that we have a public school that's sorting by test scores. We have neighborhood selection, right? Well, in a common enrollment, it's supposed to be a citywide issue, right? You can theoretically, because of competition and choice, go to any school in the district. Well, the schools in the wealthier parts of New Orleans actually have neighborhood boundary markers on their uh, enrollments, right? Attendance at previous school, right? So if you're going to like the French-speaking preschool, then you have a line into the French-speaking um, first grade, right? And so if you don't speak French at age five, you cut out of that school. That's just one example. Um, they have uh, sibling attendance, right? IEPs, behavioral issues, all of these are used to select um, schools, right? So we have what happens to the kids in these schools? And we've gone in, and these are not our tiers. We've found an eight-tier um, declining line of um, achievement by the type of school, and these are the types of schools that are operating in New Orleans in 2011, 2012. And when we break it down by type tier, tier one versus tiers two and three, we see that white people are overwhelmingly represented at the top tier schools. And then we go to African Americans. I'm a statistician. Usually you don't find lines that are like directly <laughs> down. You know, it's just like, you're just looking at this like, this is ridiculous. Okay. So um, I'm going to say two more things. One, we have found in New Orleans, in Chile, in Sweden, that the market-based strategies create all of these um, outcomes that are unfavorable to the public. 
public investment strategies in Finland, in um, Cuba, and in Canada that we looked at are helpful for students. And I'm going to just, I want to plant one more seed here because Ontario, just north of the border, they actually voucherized their system in the 90s and the public didn't like it. And in 2003, they voted that government out, they instituted a whole system reform plan, their PEST scores have gone up, the public satisfaction has gone up, and the teacher labor unions sit at the table with the government and make decisions together to provide education for students. Mm. Thank you. So it's totally unfair to follow these speakers, uh, totally unfair. Um, I couldn't also, I couldn't decide on what I wanted to call my talk, so I just gave it two names. <laughs> Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing, and or what instead. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Cal State, Berkeley, Stanford, a uh, big company, right? Um, uh, I also serve as the education chair for California NAACP. So glad to see Freddie from uh, Hayward NAACP, good friend. Thank you for being here. Um, also, I'm the founder of Cloaking in Equity, which is an education policy and social justice co-op. If you have not been there, have all the ammunition you need against charters, Teach for America, high stakes testing, it's all there for you for the waiting, for the taking. Cloaking and Equity, one of the top 50 blogs uh, in, the, in the nation uh, in education. Um, Did you help with this? It's in the light. In the light. Uh, no, that's a skylight, so. Yeah, I don't. I mean, and if I move it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to. Give it two minutes and it'll, the sun will be. So. Yeah, so cloaking inequity. If you cannot remember the name, all you have to do is go to Google, type in Julian Blog Professor, and it'll be the first on the sheet. On the sheet, okay. <laughs> also, please tweet at me from this talk. Okay, I need to get moving. Okay, so uh, as many of you have, have, have seen, you've seen the data, you've probably lived this bad news. There's been bad news in Oakland Public Schools for a long time. No one's disputing that public schools, it's that elephant in the room, that our nation rations a high quality education for poor kids versus wealthy kids. The wealthy have been able to throw money at education for a long time. Education reform, when we're talking about these neoliberal policies, when, we're ta when we say we don't want to throw money at education, what we're really talking about is poor kids. What we're really talking about is students of color, Latino right. students, African American students, Asian American students. That's what we're really talking about here, folks. And so I get that. So don't play that race card on me. Don't play that poverty card on me, because I understand that this is pre-existing ideology, and as uh, Dr. Scott talked about, it's actually not about those kids at all. It's about that $4.6 trillion uh, pie that they like to have a piece of. Now, we know the data. We, it's very clear. The achievement gap is, 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 is readily apparent. Now, you've heard these very common arguments in favor of school choice. Now, I've taken a few from Libre. Libre is the Coke-funded effort to convince Latinos that um, charter schools and choice is a good idea. You've heard these. You've heard failing schools still receive money. Latino students still make up the majority of students in failing schools. There's no incentive if you increase funding. Schools are more innovative with school choice. There's a whole list. You've heard them all. You've heard them from Democrats. You've heard it from Republicans. They basically sound the same. You look at Barack Obama, and I'm sorry to say this. I was on Barack Obama's Education Policy Committee during his campaign in 2008. I voted for him twice, and his education policy looks exactly the same as George W. Bush. In fact, in fact he doubled down on tests and charters and everything else, right? So, so, is choice the civil rights issue of our day? That's what they're telling us, right? This is the civil rights issue of our day. Rachel Campos Duffy in the American Spectator, this is what she said, and was probably paid by the Koch brothers to say that. But my Education <coughs> Review Journal article demonstrates that school choice is a civil rights issue, but not as currently framed. First, you should know, School choice on average does not produce the equity and social justice that proponents spend. It's very clear. If you look at 10 years of the peer-reviewed research literature, and I went to 10 of the top scholars in education choice, and I asked them, give me the best research on this. Janelle was one of them. 
and I put together a compendium of research. Charters accentuate, they um, uh, increase the amount of segregation in schools. I have a new piece coming out in the Stanford uh, Law and Policy that demonstrates this statistically. What we're talking about here, folks, this is not ideology. This is not opinion. We're talking about research study after research study after research study. This is what the data says. Now, I'm not going to say, for example, uh, the Friedman Foundation came out this week and said, oh, there's 35 studies that say school choice is great. But let me tell you about those studies. Most of them not peer reviewed, which is the gold standard in the research literature. Second thing you should know about them is that the Walton Foundation, the Broad Foundation, and all these other folks fund those research studies. So when you see that deceptive advertising that says studies say this, just know they have typically not gone through the rigorous peer review standard, and they're typically funded by neoliberal nonprofits and foundations and other folks that are part of this cabal. Second, as, uh, as Janelle talked about, Dr. Scott talked about, school choice has created this motley alliance between privatizers and traditional civil rights proponents that is not in the best interest of poor and minority students. Now, one of the things that I'm proud of uh, from the, about the NAACP is the national office gets it on this issue. Okay. They get it. Yes. They get it. In fact, I just received a PowerPoint from the national office that is critical of charter schools. Now, that's not to say that every chapter across the United States or across the state of California has this right. But let me tell you, the national office of NAACP does, and at state convention, we voted a critical resolution against charter schools uh, from the state of California and NAACP. So know that. Know that. Know that national and state are very critical of what's happening with school choice right now. I'm arming you with lots of evidence right now. Have you noticed? So there's a lot of things. So we've been talking about the macro levels, but I want to quickly talk about how charters do this on the micro level. Now, a really excellent piece from Kevin Wellner called The Dirty Dozen in the Teacher's College Record. Dirty Dozen, Kevin Wellner. This talks about, in the research literature, the 12 ways that charters do the choosing instead of families do the choosing, right? Because you've got to be prepared for these Coke folks. You've got to be prepared for these Walton-funded foundation folks. You've got to be prepared for these Teach for America folks. And yes, I just said that. Description <laughs> and design. Which niche? We talked about that. You just talked about the niche with, you know, you have to have the French to get access to the French school. Location, location, location. Karen Royal, from, uh, uh, who's a parent activist, had five schools in her neighborhood, none of which her child could attend. She could not choose those schools. Her child had to get on the bus and go an hour and a half every day across town to a school that would accept her child. Mad Men, the mar power of marketing. Now, there is nobody better than marketing, maybe, than the Gulen affiliated charter schools with their math and science academies and their uh, math uh, uh, art fairs that they do, right? And it, for you that have been paying attention, watch the, f the film Killing Ed, which Miss Higgins is, is featured in. Uh, Killing Ed, Gulen affiliated charter schools. This is the top is going to come off of this. And they are experts at marketing what they're doing. Um, hooping it up, conditions placed in applications, whether it be like uh, uh, essays that are required to get in. This is another way that they filter kids out of, out of charter schools. Uh, legal and dicey practices. So for example, last year, the California charter schools were requiring parents, if they couldn't do their volunteer hours, to pay instead which is against the California law. And so fortunately, um, uh, 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 folks stood up for those families and the California Charter School Association pulled back because they understood that this was against uh, the law. Uh, conditions placed on enrollment, creaming in, uh, particular students, Frank talks about that. The bum steers, you know, we don't really have the special ed services that your child mm -hmm. could uh, access here at our school. You might want to try the traditional public school down the street. Not in service point to the unavailability of resources and services. Uh, the fitness test, counseling parents out and students out, you know, you're just not a good fit for this school. You're not a good fit for basis charter school. Okay, flunk or leave. Uh, I've heard of KIPP charter school saying, look, if you stay at KIPP next year, we're going to grade retain you. But if you go to the traditional public school, you'll be in fourth grade next year instead of third grade. 
Uh, disciplinary policies, uh, Frank has talked about this, I'm giving a lecture tomorrow at the Society for Prevention Research about school discipline. The recent civil rights project showed that charter schools disparately discipline Latino and African American boys compared to traditional public schools. Let that sink in. We have a very serious problem in traditional public schools, and it's even worse in charter schools. And you know, I was just thinking when, when you were talking about this, you know, just imagine what I was like in the third and fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then the, the, the last one's about backfilling. So let's keep going. I don't know how much time I have left. So the question, the old political adage is you can't fight something with nothing. We've gone around saying we don't like tests. We don't like charter schools, right? And we know why we don't like them. We don't like them because they're aristocratic reforms. They're top down. They're about private control. They're about privatization. They're about the elites controlling the resources of our society. That's what all of these reforms have in common. But there's alternative folks. There's alternatives in the research literature to each of these things that they have proposed. And let's talk about some of them. I, we call it community-based reforms. I'm trying to change two computers here. So we know that we've had this dominant paradigm of private control. If you think about, let me just give you one example real quick. Think about No Child Left Behind. What the biggest impact that No Child Left Behind, I believe, had on our society is it privatized assessment. Did you think about that? Yeah. What it did was, is it gave billions of dollars over to private companies to test our kids. So instead of trusting educators to assess our children, we now hand over the assessment of our children to corporations. That's what No Child Left Behind did. Top down, privatized education reform. So top-down hierarchical models ostracize community-based alternatives. Time? Almost there? Okay. So here are the options. On the left, we have top-down private control, value-added teacher modeling, Teach for America, corporate for-profit charters, school district closure, takeover schemes, common app, privatized assessment. On the right, we have all the alternative community-based reforms that have research literature that underlie them. What's next, quickly? can't fight something with nothing, you, we now, I can, you can now weaponize all the different community-based reforms. So when they play that race card, when they play that poverty card, what you say is, I'm against top-down private control reforms. I am for community-based reforms. So charter schools, I'm for community schools with wraparound services, maybe some community-based charters, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So we, we can't master financial resources, folks. We just can't. But we have people power. So with social and new media, we can communicate these messages to our communities in ways we never could before. We must create alliances, these natural alliances. And I believe that's why you are here in this room today. We must hold nonprofits, political parties, and civil rights organizations accountable for the blatant privatization and private control movement for our public schools. And finally, the last thing I'll say, I promise. <laughs> Connect enthusiastically, give relentlessly, lead bravely. Do these and a future of community-based education reform will be ours for our children. Thank you. Schools <laughs> was like 11th on the list, right? And the challenge is, is that particularly in California, where we went from a top spending state to a bottom spending state over two decades, is that schools haven't been able to provision, especially in poor neighborhoods and middle class neighborhoods, what parents actually want in those schools. So one of the interesting things that I'm hearing from Southern California uh, as, as a form of social protest is that parents want to invoice their legislators for what they want in their schools. <laughs> Send them an invoice. This is what we want in our schools. We want teachers that are qualified, that are certified. We want to have AP classes. And this is what it costs, right? Uh, so I think there's a lot of, uh, I think we need to be more unique about our social protests around this particular issue, and we need to bring more attention because now with social media and new media, we can bring a lot of attention to these issues because the gatekeepers and the, at the newspapers and the TV stations can't stop us from making the public aware of what's out there. So I think we need to get a little more creative with our social protests and make people aware of what parents really want in our schools. I think we have to be really careful not to demonize parents for making choices <coughs> in a in
in a system in which you know they haven't cho cho chosen the choice set, right? They, they're working within really limited means, real limited information, um, and having to compete with other parents, right? <laughs> for spaces for their children, for opportunities for their children. And so I don't think that's the level at which we should be. I, I think there's some shame I, I see in the research literature and the kind of commentariat. Um, where I think there's some possibilities for kind of community building and community understanding is to have parents in conversation with each other, right? That we have many parents whose children have been pushed out of charter schools, who have been denied access, right? And so when we have parents saying, well, this school has saved my life, we have to have that conversation held constant with families um, who have been screened out, who have been told that their children are undesirable, right? Um, and so I would like to see more cross-group efforts to have cross-group conversations. So there are families who really value these opportunities and these choices, right? Um, but there are families who've been really hurt by them and whose schools have really been hurt by them. Those things can exist at the same time. And I think we have to be careful to not paint this with too blunt a brush, right? Um, and keep in mind, I think, always, that these are their larger forces at work here that are really shaping um, the, and constraining the choices that parents have in Oakland and in other cities. So uh, I want to jump in on that point because um, and, and that, I think, is part of the conversation, right? There are these larger top-down forces that are in play. And what I'm doing with New Orleans is showing you uh, outcomes that are five or ten years down the road. So, you know, right now, okay, so, uh, excuse me, uh, New Orleans had a, a hurricane, right? And that was seen as a political opportunity and seized on as a political opportunity. So what do you do if you don't have a hurricane? Right? And there's a whole <laughs> set of processes that you have to engage in around how do you close certain schools, how do you institute a program that, that segregates students, that's the outcome. And the uh, rationale is that you're going to bring in cheaper teachers and you're basically going to be making profit from public money. So, um, and that is happening right now in Oakland, but it's just not as far along in the trajectory. So <coughs> this is your warning call from a researcher, right? Um, when you look at the, the way that the, the district is being run, um, you know, the New York Times published an article about the Broad Foundation playbook for school closure that's being actually evolving from the learnings from New Orleans Detroit, other places that are further along in this trajectory. So this movement is iterative on the kind of privatizer side as well. They're learning, they're trying different strategies, and those strategies are playing out. And this whole framing around next year having common enrollment as an equity-based approach is basically uh, saying that we're, we haven't done our homework to look at what equity, whether equity was actually achieved in New Orleans, Detroit, and I just showed that very much it was not. I just, one thing I would also add that, that we didn't get to talk about on the panel is that there is a research advocacy side to Common Enrollment in One App as well that I think is important to note. And you have centers at places like MIT that are actually designing the algorithms for these systems, right? And the, the hope for researchers, largely economists of education, who want to do experimental design work is they're hoping that creating all choice systems like New Orleans creates a kind of perfect experiment environment, right? Where you, and then if you have the data of families who are choosing or listing preferences, you can actually measure effect sizes of families who get their preferences versus families who don't. So there's a whole data apparatus aspect to this that people in the research community are very much a part of. They're not only designing the algorithms, but they're, me they're using these algorithms to measure things um, and to build academic careers. And so I think we shouldn't leave researchers. Um, I got two <laughs> points. I got to make two quick points on that. One, that's an unauthorized experiment on an entire city of people in New Orleans. And number no two, institutional review board on that. if no IRB, what it took for me to get mm -hmm. to even interview a parent in that mm -hmm. city is way beyond what they've done with an entire city of schools. And secondly, if you're going to run an experiment, you should provide the data so it could be validated. And that did not happen. Yeah. So. But, that, but it's also going to be a part of the design. Of the and I think we need to be paying attention to Definitely. the okay, algorithm. Okay, guys, we got to move on. Working on the summer, um, there, are, there are examples in each of these 
of, of how communities are doing them. So for example, with community schools in Austin, they've turned around the middle school and the high school that were slated for closure on a No Child Left Behind uh, with the community schools model, which is the wraparound model. Um, in, in terms of um, uh, community-based assessment, um, instead of this sort of top-down stuff, there's a New York Performance Coalition which is a set of schools that evaluates uh, uh, students based on qualitative and quantitative data, project-based uh, portfolios. And actually, you don't actually have to go to New York. You just go across the bay here to Belmont and some of these peninsula schools. That they're, they're, eva they're evaluating their students in that way, too, in some places. So uh, yes, there are communities across the United States. And actually, California is an example of how we're doing accountability in a new way with the LCAPs and the LCFF, which is that we stepped out two years ago and said we're going to have these strategic planning approaches and we're going to involve communities. There's a lot to be desired. We're still working on it. But after 15 years of, of top-down stuff from the Bush administration, we are making great strides. And there's a lot of states that are looking at what we're doing with the LCAPs and the LCFFs. Uh, Texas is looking at this. And ESSA also allows for other states to do things like the LCFF and LCAP. So actually California is a model for this bottom-up accountability, local accountability. So yes. The answer is yes, there is examples in each of these. I try to write about them on, on my blog, but I know it's hard to keep up with the blog, so I'm going to write a book and I'm going to put all the stories <laughs> in one spot. Frank, Jonathan, um, on the scholarly side, um, around the importance of investing in teacher quality, right? Um, paying teachers fairly and paying them well so that they stay. We know that teachers who are high quality often leave. Uh, school districts and the ones who stay are often under such duress, right, um, that, that their working conditions are not ideal for children, right? I mean, we need to be, keep our eyes focused on that. I think, you know, we haven't talked about the other aspect of life in the United States right now, which is that we are witnessing the, the um, largest gap in terms of economic equality since the Great Depression. Um, and that in our public schools, for the first time in our country, we the majority of children in public schools are Right? And so I think when we often think about, well, let's focus on what works, we sort of forget that we also have to think about changing our economic system um, and making it more fair uh, so that families can... And what's funny is the very mechanism that created the inequality in our schools, we want to use that same mechanism to remedy the inequality that that system created. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm a, yeah and I'm, I just want to build on this. Um, you know, uh, my dissertation looked at 70 different countries and the effects of income inequality, and it is bad if you are at the low end, right? It's worse for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're at the high end in a more unequal country, you're still doing worse. Mm -hmm. It's no good for anybody. Mm -hmm. And we just haven't really got that yet. That yeah. income inequality and inequality in general is bad for everybody. And I, I'm going to just keep going back. Mm -hmm. Finland. Mm -hmm. That's an inequity, and there's standard deviation in front of us 40 years later. No homework. And with no homework. I mean, I mean, and, 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 and to Janelle's, to Janelle's teacher point, they pay for their, pay, their teachers to go get a master's degree before they go to the classroom. It's like a Finnish teacher doesn't get to a classroom before an American teacher's already gone. <laughs> let me, let me. So I'm on the board of the Network for Public Education with Diane Rabbit, and I've seen each of these folks at that conference. Um, one of the things that the Network for Public Education has done is we've started a podcast about Teach for America called Truth for America. It's on iTunes. If you just type in Truth for America into iTunes, it's also on YouTube. And actually, episode four, we interview Oakland teachers. And you know what they told me? Their starting salary was $33,000. And you know what else they told me? That as a special education teacher, they were required to take classes. That was another half of their salary. And that is before taxes. So what, what they had to do was live on eight or $9,000 in Oakland for 12 months. Now, they're, now, regardless of what you think about how lovely or how not lovely Teacher America is, there's something wrong, folks, asking teachers to teach in this community with $8,000 take home. That's less than $1,000 a month before taxes comes out. So listen to episode four of Truth for America. We interview two Oakland uh, teachers. One thing that strikes me is in this conversation, it's like we've got to protect the TFAers who are in the room who've done this work. 
I, I, this is not personal. This is systemic, uh -huh. right? So we're talking about what kind of system do we have that puts teachers without experience in front of a classroom in, in one of the more challenging environments, right? So it, it's not personal, but it is, um, it, it is inequitable. American teacher, um, and I don't feel the need, I don't feel attacked, or and I don't feel the need to be protected. <laughs> so I'll just put that out there. And, and I've also done research on Teach for America alumni, um, and I should say I was I was a critical Teach for America core member from the beginning, I, I was, and I'm old, so I was in the second year. Um, so I, you know, there was at a time where we really didn't even really understand what we were getting ourselves into. But in my research with Tina Trujillo at Berkeley on Teach for America alumni that span 1990 to 2011, one of the things that we were trying to understand was how, um, what they believe the causes of inequality were, what they believe the most plausible solutions were to that inequality, and how Teach for America helped to shape their career pathways, right? Um, and what we found was very interesting that mapped onto the racial and socioeconomic demographics of the core members is that core members who identified um, and relayed their experience as being white uh, from largely suburban and wealthy backgrounds located the cause of educational inequality with teachers, right? Um, and really filtered the messages they got from Teach for America about the causes for inequality mm -hmm. through that prism. That if we could really get better teachers, better talent in the classroom, we could eradicate equity. And if they didn't locate it at teachers, they located it at managers, so district leaders, right? And that shaped the direction they went into in terms of advocacy. Core members who came from poor backgrounds, um, who were of color, largely diagnosed educational inequality causes to structural issues, right? So they certainly saw teachers and schools as a part of that structure, but were much more attentive to issues of economic inequality, racism, mm -hmm. sexism, right? Um, and other isms, right, that so often shape the opportunity structures for kids, um, and reported much more conflict about the messages they were getting from the organization. And so, I, I relay those findings to say that I think there's a real opportunity for engagement uh, with people who are disillusioned with um, a more managerial kind of blame teachers and teacher unions for their sort of stuck in the mudness and, and getting in the way of reform, that there are folks within that network who are very hungry for more information and they don't get it through these very narrow messaging um, networks that they're a part of. They, they do their credentialing programs through together uh, through contracted arrangements with, with different organizations, they don't have a lot of opportunity to get alternative messaging. Um, and if they didn't come from backgrounds where they're open to that, they're simply not going to get it.